Hey guys, Brad here from Scooter Street. Got a, um, a bit more of an interesting build video here for you today. So I've got this Piaggio Zip behind us. Um, and this is a customer scooter who's, um, who's purchased this bike and the previous owner has uh, attempted to, to do a fair bit of tuning to it. Now um, this is a really good example of someone who's had, who's had most of the right idea but um, has not quite followed through on the execution. And uh, the main problem with this bike is that uh, a, a number of the parts haven't been properly matched. Um, and this is something that can happen uh, with an inexperienced tuner or someone who has most of the right idea but isn't quite there. So the major problem with this scooter at the moment um, is that uh, it's got a seized piston. So the reason this has happened is because the person who's tuned this scooter has put uh, a race carby, pod filter, race exhaust, race transmission, uh, race crank as well, but um, only a very basic cast iron cylinder kit. And uh, uh, primarily the exhaust uh, and the, uh, the carby have sort of over exhausted the kit and um, it's, it's seized up a couple of times. It's led, it led to the person basically giving up on it and moving it on to the next person, which is our customer. So um, I've done a bit of a pre-assessment on the bike. I've seen there's uh, quite a couple of um, sort of little unusual things that the previous owner has done. They've had, like I said, most of the right idea, but not quite followed through in the execution very well. So uh, because it has a race crank, race carby, race exhaust, um, that was the, the main attractive, um, attracting features that the, the purchaser of this bike was looking for. So, um, uh, I've done, like I said, I've done a bit of an assessment on it and um, I think this bike is going to be uh, a really prime candidate for an MHR racing uh, cylinder kit. This is a Bridgeport kit um, that requires a, a large carby and a full race exhaust to run properly. And this bike already has both of those things um, and as we'll get into it, it actually has a whole bunch of other really good race gear uh, already ready to go and basically the, the one element that was missing was the cylinder. So we're going to go ahead and get that cylinder on. We're going to do a bunch of little um, repair items while we're in there as well um, and a bunch of chassis upgrades as well which we've found work uh, really well on this bike namely the uh, the Melossi uh, racing rear shoes MHR front pads we're going to be doing a, a YSS uh, rear shock it's not the best shock that you can get but value for money it makes a really big difference to one of these bikes because the uh, factory shock is really spongy and they uh, very commonly um, fail inside the seal and leak and just get very bouncy in the rear end um, and we're also going to be doing um, a couple of um, uh, minor, minor upgrades, including some race tyres as well. Okay, I'm going to start off by stripping some parts so I can get some better access to, um, to the, the cylinder area. I'm probably going to start off just installing the cylinder kit straight up, and then um, we'll get into the rest of it as we go. Okay, so we've got our MHR cylinder here. Now, we've done a bit of a pre-assembly on this fella. So. If you've not seen one of these before in real life, they are beautiful, really nice quality cylinder. Single ring, Nicosil bore. Just want to show you there. See that? Obviously, enormous bridge port. So that's where the name Bridgeport comes from, because uh, this uh, piece here, which they uh, they call a bridge, and obviously all the intake ports are, are huge, along with the uh, actual size of the exhaust port. This has two different gasket kits with it. Now, this is the same gasket kit that's used in uh, pretty much every other uh, air-cooled kit for a Piaggio. Paper-based gasket with the, um, with the uh, rubber uh, O-ring. I think it's Viton, uh, actually. Special high-heat rubber. So, um, then we've got this here, which comes in all the racing kits. Anything that's single ring gets one of these kits. Now, uh, these gaskets here, uh, I think there's four or five of them in there. They're at varying, th uh, varying thicknesses, 0.04 mil. That's uh, very, very thin. I'll come out to this one here, he's 0 0.16, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.25, and 0 0.1. So uh, what you can do with these, um, obviously you have a bunch of different thicknesses here. Um, we're gonna measure the squish, 
I'm going to read the manual in a minute. Uh, from memory, I think it's about 0.7 mils, what the squish should be. Uh, if we have a squish of 0.7, that means that the cylinder, uh, the piston, sorry, at top dead center, this is the absolute highest point of the piston, is uh, 0.7 mil away from the head. The top of the piston, 0.7 mil. So this is where we get our squish from, and I'll show you how to measure this in a moment. But um, the squish is really important because if you have too much squish, um, you end up with pre-ignition issues, or the piston, when it gets hot, can actually hit the top of the head, which um, is a super duper, very big issue. So um, pre-ignition essentially, uh, or sometimes it's called dieseling, is where there's, uh, once the bike's running and gets warm, there's so much compression um, that the, the heat of, uh, the heat inside the cylinder mixed with the compression alone is enough to make the fuel ignite rather than waiting for the spark. What I'm gonna do, and this is always the safest bet with the, one of these kits, install the paper gasket first. Always start off with the paper gasket because you might put that in and um, the squish is 0.7. So, you know, if you'd put in uh, a really, really thin base gasket, it's going to be very, very, very close. So I'm going to have a quick read through these instructions and um, just refresh my memory to make sure that it definitely is 0 0.7 and I'll quickly uh, assemble this kit. Now, uh, one of the things I hadn't mentioned yet is the, the previous uh, previous owner has um, uh, ground the end of these um, of the engine studs off. I've actually not seen engine studs like this that are threaded the whole way. Normally, they're more like this. So what I'm going to do is put a uh, put a new set of these engine studs in. I've got our Mossy paper gasket, and I've got those new studs on there as well. Gonna gently put that on there because you can tear these gaskets pretty easily if you're careless. Slide them down there. I'll just put some two-stroke oil on that spine bearing. So what I'm going to do here, carefully slide the cylinder up. Now, can't really say that there's any good tip that I can give you here outside of take your time and exercise plenty of patience because if you stuff this up things can go really wrong for you so basically this to end there I usually pop the screwdriver through because you need to line up that um, gudgeon pin with the small line bearing so you notice when I've done this, I've had the piston slotted into the cylinder already um, with the ring uh, inside the cylinder skirt. So it's uh, in position because it can be a little bit of a pain to, um, to do otherwise. So I'm going to try and do it like this first. Sometimes it, it's just too hard with the circlet and yeah, take, take the cylinder back off and then um, just do it with the piston loose in there because you can get around it a bit better. I'm going to show you something that I have always done. So. Obviously, this is what we're going to be putting our circlip in here. You notice I've sort of stuffed a rag into the, the bottom of the crank casing there and sort of flipped it over. And the reason for this is, um, if uh, you try and put this circlip in, they are sort of a springy little, little piece of metal. If it does happen to flick out, because this rag is there, it'll do two things. If the circlip hits the rag, it won't bounce off the rag, like it will bounce off a metallic surface. You would be amazed how far these things can travel if they, um, if they do hit a hard surface like concrete or the bench, they, um, they fly off and they are notoriously incredibly difficult to find. Now I've got a bunch of spares here, but you might not. So if it hits this rag, it's gonna stop. And because it stops, it's not gonna go into the crank casing. Now that, you know, the, the, the circlip can go just about anywhere. If it goes into the crank casing, that's literally the one place that is gonna cause a problem because I'm gonna have to try and somehow get it out. And uh, if it hooks itself around a metallic part or a bearing or something and gets stuck, we are, um, we're in big trouble, we're pretty much dead in the water until I get it out. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I've seen uh, people have to split the crank casing before because they've lost 
a small piece in there and not being able to get it out. So uh, of course the one time I don't film it is the time I just nail it first go. But uh, that one uh, just went straight in. Now the really important thing is it's good to spend a little bit of time here to make sure that that circlip is absolutely 100% seated properly because they can sometimes just sort of uh, jam in place without being all the way in the groove. A special little groove inside there. So take a bit of time, sort of really look around to make sure that, that circlip is in that groove because uh, if it's not, you're going to have a really bad seizure. So um, that's uh, I'm very, very confident that's all the way in there. As you can see, I've had to take the cylinder off just to get my hands around it to uh, sort of get my thumb around the side of the the uh, circlip to hold it down as I um, as I got it in with the, um, the little prod. Again, it's just a, a matter of taking your time and making sure that it's in the right spot. See, that's I can see from here that's ever so slightly off. Like it's going to be a pain. So I want to get it in the right spot. I just have to pinch it first and then get the cylinder on that way so it can't move too much. Now, how I knew that it wasn't, the ring wasn't in the right spot before, and that it is now is because if you can see at the very, very top there, right where the torch is, there's like a little tiny mark, and that's where the two ends of the ring are meeting. If I can try and get it in focus there. Yeah, that's where the two ends of the ring are meeting, and see how they're both at the same level? They're sitting nicely. This means that the ring is in the correct spot. Slide that one down. Now, what you do at this stage, I usually give it a little turn, just make sure everything's sort of sitting nicely, which it is. Cool, pretty happy with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that down a little bit. Get our head. Obviously these are directional. You see there's a fair bit more cylinder on the bottom than there is on the top, and uh, the same is true on the head. Tiny bit of two-stroke oil around, just a tiny bit. If you go and over-oil it, the first couple of plugs you're gonna use, it's just gonna going to be so rich with oil, it's going to foul them right up. So the key is not too much oil. And that oil obviously heaps, helps keep the O-ring seated in place when you're installing it. Same thing. Yep. Very confident that's on nicely. Now when you're doing this, you don't want to under tighten them because it'll give you a false reading. But if you over tighten them, because the studs are steel and the engine casing is alloy, you can very easily strip the engine casing. Now, I've just gotten them to the point they're just grabbing. So obviously, once you get them to that point, use the star pattern, which should, is, is good practice with anything, whether it's wheel nuts on a car or cylinder studs on a, on a bike, and that's the cross. Always cross pattern, so you're keeping, the, um, keeping it even as you tighten it. Okay. All right, now we're gonna do a squish test. Now grab some solder, I'll show you how this is done. Gonna need some nice, thick solder. Uh, Molossi specifically recommend no uh, thinner in diameter than 1.5 mil. This stuff's, I think, 2.1. Uh, it must be solder, so it's nice and soft and malleable, and it can be squished by the piston without damaging it. And you're gonna need a, your vernier caliper. So what you're gonna do here, is um, I'll use a nice flat end. So I'm gonna sort of curve the end of this. Usually you probably leave, um, I don't know, about, about 30 mil there. So you can really get to the edge of the, um, the piston. That might be a little bit too much, but we'll see in a moment. So you're gonna insert that down into the cylinder. And not near the exhaust port, yeah. I've, I've given it too much there. Probably about that much is gonna be appropriate. All right. Not to go in, in any of the ports, so we'll usually be safe. I'll get the piston pretty close to the top, so all the ports are closed off. Okay, just obviously I'm trying not to get the solder to go into the port and then snap the end of it off. So, all right, to do it on the plastic fan, get a bit more leverage gently and slowly. Okay, 
can see it sort of squashed at the end of it there. Now that's our squish value. So that's 1.1. So that's about twice what we need to have. So we're going to need to go ahead and change that base gasket. Normally measure it in a couple of spots. I usually try and grab it with the big flat spot, but it's about 1.1. That's definitely too much. It needs to be um, lossy, so between 5.5 between, uh, and 6, I believe it was. So I'm going to go ahead and pop this, um, this base gasket out. We're going to have to change it. We're going to have to redo all that stuff again, but I'm not going to show you all that again uh, with inserting the piston and, and all that sort of thing. Okay, so I've actually uh, I've gone ahead and put uh, the thickest of the metal gaskets in because uh, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to build an actual race bike here. I'd like this thing to uh, to actually be uh, you know some sort of remote level of reliability. So you know obviously this is a racing cylinder, so the um, the measurements and the recommendations that Melossi are giving you are for racing. So I'm going to go ahead and back it off a little bit and probably aim for somewhere around. Um, Okay, probably somewhere around the, um, the 0 0.7, 0 0.8, as I mentioned. Squish. Turn this, turn it. So, Molossi recommend, I wasn't recommending before, doing this five times. Now, I normally wouldn't do it that many times, but because this is the final squish test, hopefully, really, because it's not squishing it any further. All right, so yeah, definitely some more squish. I'll go grab the uh, verniers. Yeah, that's right on 0 0.8, so I'm pretty happy with that. I'm not really looking to um, to go, yeah, see, in some points it's down to 0.75, so that, yeah, so I'm pretty happy with that. I'm not uh, not trying to set any wide records, just like to uh, have a pretty quick scooter. So I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, swap a couple of these bolts out uh, to suit the shroud. I'll get the shroud back on. Uh, and start uh, reassembling that um, that cylinder side of things. I'm going to do a little bit of assembly, you know, chucking a bunch of bits and pieces on all the boring stuff. I'm not going to show you because it's you know it's all pretty basic stuff. So, I'm going to go ahead and do that. And um, when I'm ready to uh, chuck the reed valve in a, in a moment, I'll um, I'll um, I'll jump back on. Obviously, exhaust's on. Um, I've connected up the um, the CDI, put a plug in it, uh, all those basic things, and um, tried to give it a hit. Uh, no go. So um, I've removed the pod filter and sprayed a little bit of um, starty bastard in there. It actually started straight up, so it tells me it's got no fuel on it or there's some sort of fueling issue. So this is the point where I'm going to start sort of uh, going over the bike with a fine tooth comb, particularly in the tuning settings. I'm going to pop the carby apart and I'll have a look because it feels like there's something unusual going on there with the throttle cable. It's binding up there somewhere, so I'm um, going to have to sort that out. Um, the other issue is I'm going to have to, uh, it seems like there's maybe a bit of a fuel leak. I'm going to have to sort this out. And... Um, I'm going to um, uh, inspect all the settings on the carby. Okay, so I'm just getting this reed valve out, this factory one. And I've just noticed, obviously I've popped this off. Uh, from the factory, these often have a couple of security bolts in them. So get those out and just put some normal hex ones in, which uh, the person who's fitted the um, the previous cylinder kit's obviously done that. So to pop the slide out, obviously, and um, this all comes completely free with those two bolts. And uh, there's our reed valve. I've obviously installed the... Um, and focus the uh, Polini pedals when they've done the kit. But what I've just noticed is I, I mentioned this bike had a bit of a fuel leak. And um, you can see the fuel lines on this. I'll just pop that off a carb. I don't know how well you can see, but they're all they're all cracked. They're all there you go. They're all cracked and in really poor really poor condition. So I would say these are either um there's some cheap fuel lines that they'll put on. Um or I know they're not the factory fuel lines. The factory fuel line is usually um black, but a lot of the time this clear stuff it goes off. Um, and um, eventually just cracks and leaks. So while I'm in here, I'm going to replace this. Um, we have just some black stuff we use in the shop that um, is nice and rubbery and it lasts a fair while. So I'm going to um, go and replace that because uh, there's a good chance that that is the, um, the source of the fuel leak there. Uh, even if it's not, it's definitely worth replacing. So yeah, obviously this is going to provide significantly more air. Now the job of the reed valve is to make sure that air can come into the engine but doesn't go back out for, um, for compression. This is how you crank it, essentially pumps air into the cylinder. So um, I'm going to pop this one in. Um, these are, um, look, the, the, if you're doing a performance carby, they're worth doing. Um, if you're not, if you're still at the level of, um, you know, maybe you've got a cylinder kit and exhaust, uh, putting a, a, a high-end reed valve in isn't really going to make much of a difference, honestly. Uh, it's not till you're doing significant carb tuning where you're um, uh, allowing the engine to be able to suck more air. You need to... Um, to uh, 
essentially upgrade this to, to reduce the potential of a bottleneck. Okay guys, so I thought I'd just show you where I'm up to. I'm, um, I've pretty much diagnosed all the issues. So I had an issue with the throttle cable. I've um, fixed that up. I was going to replace the whole assembly, but I've ended up not needing to do that. So um, that's all working properly now, although I could probably use a new cable. I've um, also discovered this. This is really common on the zips. So that's where the fuel sensor is. Um, obviously, it's been putted up because there's a leak. It's really common for these to develop a leak in that particular spot. So that's been puttied up and it's still leaking, so I'll, um, I'll let the guy know he's going to probably need a new fuel tank. So fortunately they're not too expensive on these, they're just a, a real pain to replace because you need to strip the whole back of the bike apart and under and all that sort of stuff. So um, I've also replaced all of the lines as well. On a project like this I'll often just replace the fuel just to eliminate that as a, um, a potential cause because you can chase your tail for a really long time uh, with the bike not running properly and it turns out just to be old yucky fuel. So Got um, fresh fuel in there, obviously, because it's not running a, uh, an oil pump, it's running um, premix. So I've mixed it at about 40 to 1. Um, and I'll probably run this about 50 to 1, um, you know, just for general riding. But uh, being that it's running, you know, I think 40 to 1 is probably on the money. So um, I'm going to go put all the panels back on now. And um, I'll uh, to take it outside and take it for a little run and see how it, um, how it feels. I just want to talk a little bit quickly about, uh, about carb tuning, because I'm pretty much at that point now. So we get asked this all the time with carb tuning and also with air boxes versus pod filters. Now just really quickly address air boxes versus pod filters. Now obviously a pod filter is going to supply significantly more air to the engine versus an air box. Now with pod filters versus air boxes, the big, the big defining uh, question that you need to ask yourself, you know, should I run a pod or should I run an air box, is supply versus demand. So the cylinder, that, uh, cylinder kit that you've got, is it demanding more air than what the factory air box can supply? Now, uh, Molossi make a couple of uh, really cool products for your factory air box, including um, little air box stuffers, which are like a little sleeve. Um, you drill a hole and it sort of pops into place. And it just discourages water and debris from being sucked into the air box, um, less so than if you just drilled a straight hole. So there are ways that you can modify your factory air box. To get a little bit more, um, a little bit more supply. But uh, the problem that we have a lot of customers running into is they're running a kit that's inappropriate for a pod filter with a pod filter, and the tuning goes backwards, and they have a lot of difficulty with it. And it comes down to this supply versus demand um, sort of ratio again. So, if you've got a sport cylinder kit like a uh, Molossi Sport, um, certainly a factory uh, cylinder kit would fit into this this category. Um, as so even let's say a MHR replica. Um, which is more of a standard style port mat, it's not a bridge port. Uh, the demand that that cylinder has of air, the, the, the air that it's demanding, doesn't match a pod filter. The pod filter is going to supply more air than what that cylinder is demanding. And this creates like a bottleneck situation, but the bottleneck's at the cylinder. So what end up, ends up happening is you end up having to supply a bucket load of fuel to the carby to match the amount of air that's, um, that's being supplied to the cylinder. And you actually go backwards in tuning. And we've experienced this a number of times through testing, uh, particularly with MHR replica kits, um, which you know are pretty up there for a street kit, but they're not a bridge port kit, they're not a race kit. So what ends up happening is that you install the pod filter, tune the carby correctly for it, um, and you actually go backwards in the tuning. Particularly, uh, you'll notice that at the initial takeoff, sort of zero to 30 k's an hour, it struggles. At the top, you may gain slightly, but for the amount of loss that you're incurring at the start, is it really worth it? I don't think so. Go back on the same bike to a factory airbox, uh, say with a couple of uh, Molossi um, airbox stuffers, and you pick up a significant amount of acceleration at the start, and you're not really losing any of the top end. Very, very um, negligible. So, you know, on, a, on an MHR replica kit, or a sport kit, or even your factory cylinder, from experience, it's just not worth running a pod filter. It's inappropriate. You are supplying, uh, the pod filter is supplying more air than the engine is demanding. And so you end up with that bottleneck, which is why you go backwards. Now this changes when you install a Bridgeport cylinder kit, like as in this bike. So a Bridgeport cylinder kit, as I showed you earlier, the exhaust port and the intake ports are so huge, the demand of air actually matches the supply from the pod filter. And this is where you can start to move forward with pod filters. And you notice straight away, um, having installed many of both kits, um, pod filters on a Bridgeport kit, you're still popping wheelies, you're getting a lot of takeoff from the start, 
you're not sacrificing any of it with the pod filter. In fact, the cylinder really, it demands it, it needs it. Um, you can modify your air box a whole bunch. Putting, uh, we've seen people have some creative ideas of drilling a million holes in it. And in the end, you're probably just better off running a pod filter anyway. So and there are advantages to running a pod filter, particularly say a bike like a Piaggio Zip, the air box is really difficult to, to remove. So when you're doing tuning, a pod filter is a lot more convenient because you have a lot more access to the carb rather than having to you know, negotiate the airbox out of um, you know, the, the rear panels and the shock and the rest of it, which is quite difficult on a zip. If you've done it before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So there are advantages to running a pod filter, but it just you need to make sure that the supply of air is matching the demand of the cylinder, otherwise you are going to go backwards. I'm gonna go ahead and um, get this bike outside and take it for a, for a little uh, nip around the car park. I've set the main jet, uh, I think I set it around 95. Um, it'll be fine with this with a larger carb, you don't need as big of a, uh, a big of a jet like I mentioned earlier because of the Venturi. So with your carb tuning, I have a pretty good idea of where this bike's going to end up because I've done similar scooters before, but if you don't, um, always start high is your best bet. I've got a 48 Pilot Jet in this which is pretty big, I've got a 95 Main which is also pretty big. Start high and if the bike is so rich that it just splutters on, on the spot, blows a whole bunch of smoke and won't even move, perfect. You've done exactly what you need to do, you've started rich. If you go outside and the bike revs up straight away and just goes, you don't really have a, any frame of reference to know whether you're rich or lean, so you don't know which direction to go. Because if you run the bike lean, you run the risk of seizing the piston. So the best thing to do is get, uh, set the jets to a point that you know is going to be very rich and make sure that it is. Because if, from experience before, um, set what I thought would, would be a bit rich and it wasn't, the bike ran well and I actually had to increase the jet. And as I did, the bike made more power. So, you know, obviously it was very lean at the start. So you need to start rich, take it for a quick nip. You know, usually um, if you've got an area where you can ride the bike sort of 20 or 30 meters and then back, uh, that, that's the best thing. So change the jet, 20 or 30 meters, you'll know straight away whether it's rich. Go down one size. When you're doing tuning, you are only ever changing one part at a time. One size, none of these huge big 10 point jet leaps and changing the rolls at the same time and now I'm going to install, no, one thing at a time. Because if you change a number of things at the same time, you have no idea which part made what difference. So it is time consuming, but this is why scooter tuning requires patience. It's not about being the most skillful person ever, it's just following a, uh, a set formula and changing one thing at a time. The easiest way you can learn about scooter tuning and, and what parts make what difference is to try them for yourself one thing at a time. That's certainly how we learn, that's how I learn. Um, how to tune scooters is by changing one thing at a time and, and seeing what difference what parts make. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, rip this outside and we'll sort of see where it's at. I'm expecting it to be pretty rich. Okay, so I've just taken it for a test ride and it's, it's gonna have a lot of power. It's really scary. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a good uh, thing to go through the bike with the fine tooth comb before you go take it for a ride. And, I've said that and now I've you know sort of inspected the transmission and probably not inspected it quite as closely enough as I should. So I've noticed that uh, when I've come back from the ride it, it seems to be binding up slightly in the rear end in, in an unusual sort of way. So I've pulled the rear torque driver off to have a look and as soon as I've pulled the nut off the uh, clutch bell and the clutch and the spring and the nut have flown straight out and smashed me directly in the face all being uh, compressed by that spring. So what I found is that the the nut that actually goes on the clutch was loose and I didn't notice. And so while the bike's been running, it's unscrewed itself. And as soon as I've pulled that nut off the outside, it's um, flown off and smashed me directly in the face. So it's a really uh, good example of uh, really go over the bike if someone else has been playing with it to make sure that um, something like this isn't gonna happen. Fortunately for me, it um, only got me in the chin, so it <laughs> didn't get me in the eye or something. But yeah, no better example that I can think of of going through the bike and checking it to make sure because um, yeah, that's um, rather unusual. I've never ever seen that happen before. It actually looks like someone's lubricated that nut when they've put it on. So they've just not put it on properly and that's uh, the end of the story. But I'll, get, I'll fix that up um, and I'll get the bike back on again. But it, um, it has a ridiculous amount of power. It's going to be really, really frighteningly powerful. So I'm going to probably have to get a replacement nut because it's flown off somewhere. 
and um, I'll get it back together. I think I'm going to put the Molossi purple spring in it that comes with um, the team variator that's actually already in this bike. So I've got that spare in a, in a spare parts box. Um, I've lightened the rollers to about four gram uh, each, and uh, I'm going to need to change these clutch springs as well because they they look like I'm not sure they look like maybe factory clutch springs. I, I don't know what's going on there. I'm going to put some uh, st stiff ones in there for sure anyway, because it's um, basically engaging immediately when there, there needs to be some delay there, because um, this, this cylinder in particular really needs to rev up to, um, to move. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and we'll catch back up in a second. Okay, so having a closer inspection, I've found that um, essentially the problem is that the thread on um, the nut that was on there was damaged as well as it being loose. Obviously that person's had problems with it before. I also found that the shoes on the Molossi clutch that it had in it are pretty much toast. I've never seen that before. It appears as though the shafts are actually bent, so I'm not sure what's going on there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put one of these Pliny G3 clutches in there. We uh, really like these clutches for a couple of reasons. We're big fans of Molossi parts, and, and 99 times out of 100 will recommend the Molossi part. However, these Pliny uh, G3 clutches are really, um, really awesome. Now, they're similar to the Delta in that they're adjustable, the Molossi Delta. But the difference with these and the Delta is um, the Delta has a sort of somewhat tricky system of weights and a little plate that has to be pulled off here to be able to adjust things. Now, these here have, um, you sort of see there, a really clever little screw adjustment system, which um, makes it really, really super easy to adjust the stiffness of these springs. Now, being this bike with a race kit, it's going to need really, really stiff um, spring settings, but it's actually got like a little gauge on here with a little block and so it shows you um, so you can match the three obviously that they need to be matched um, uh, the um, the level of tension so I'm going to tension these up a fair bit I'm going to get this in the bike I've got a, a new nut that's going to go on that, um, that torque driver it's one of another torque driver that we had here because I've never seen one of these stripped before so I don't know what the deal is there but I'm going to chuck uh, tighten these um, these springs up chuck this clutch in with the um, the uh, purple spring which I got here that's the one that comes with the MHR team variator so i try and set it back to sort of close to what it would have been if I had done the job originally. Okay, so I took it for another little uh, little spin. That clutch is a heap better. Uh, I could probably afford to go maybe a little bit um, stiffer in the springs, but we'll, we'll get there. Taking it for a quick zip out the front, it's uh, obviously probably a little bit leaner than I'd like it. I'd like it to be really rich and work down from there. So. I'm going to probably go ahead and maybe put a 110 or, or somewhere around that jet in there, and um, we'll see um, we'll see how that feels. So, but the um, the power of it is um, is gobsmacking. It's um, very very difficult to keep the front wheel down. It's uh, I'm leaning right over it and it's still lifting the front wheel up to about 20 or 30 k's an hour. Thanks for watching, guys. Look, we really appreciate your views and your support. If you have any questions you'd like to ask us um, about this scooter or, or about your scooter or any other scooter? Uh, let us know in the comments. We uh, endeavour to answer as many questions as we can. Again, uh, thanks very much for the support.